Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast, the only podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. And today's for the girls. We have Hannah Otto here. Not just for the girls, it's for anyone, honestly, that has a big goal in mind. We can learn a lot from Hannah and her recent racing experience. Uh, This is great. Hannah, how are you doing? Congrats on your big win recently. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I'm excited. And thanks to everybody who has messaged me or seen me in person and said that they're excited to hear about that on this podcast. That's really exciting. I'm excited that people care and that means they like these recaps and it does make a difference. So please, if there's anything you ever want to hear about, uh, let us know because that's why we're doing this, right? Is to inform all of you. Yeah. And there's so much we can learn from you in terms of things not going perfectly when you're going to the race, because I feel like so many of us with work and families and lives, we don't get to have, you know, the perfect pro experience where you get to go to a race a week early if it's overseas to acclimate and you get plenty of time to preview the course and you know exactly what to do and you're perfectly prepared. And it seems like things weren't perfect going into this race. So yeah, let's talk about this marathon world cup. Um, Yeah, go, go for it. Yeah, this was kind of a wild one for me for a variety of reasons. So I guess it all started a week before Clayton and I were driving to the airport after Schwam again. And, you know, I had a good race at Schwam again, but I just felt like I was really reeling from the fact that I feel or I felt like I still had that really magical result in me for the year. And I just, you know, I've had a lot of podiums, um, but I haven't had that like, oh my gosh day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the safe space of the car with Clayton, I'm like, man, when is that day coming? Like, I'm ready for it. I'm ready to win. I know I can win. He's like, well, you have a lot of opportunities left this year. Like, what what do you want to win? I was like, honestly, what I really want to win is a marathon world cup because I know I can, but we don't even have one on the calendar. And he was like, well, then why don't you race snowshoe? That's silly. If that's your goal, why don't you race it? And this was a week before the race. And thank goodness Clayton (laughs) said that because I was like, "Um, I mean, for a million reasons, including the fact that I'm not registered and I don't have the travel (laughs) plans. But you're right. It's really ridiculous. I haven't registered for this. So a week out, um, I was able to get to ask USA Cycling to register me for that World Cup. I went to Marathon Nationals in Auburn, raced that on Saturday, and then flew to Snowshoe, which anyone who's done that knows that that is not an easy travel. And then three days later, uh, so on Wednesday, I raced the Marathon World Cup. So it was very abnormal lead-in. <laughs> yeah, wait, you, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> You already had like 20 race days on the calendar this year already at this point, and you added these two just like at the last minute, both of them. I just, I just added the World Cup last okay. minute. I was already planning on doing marathon nationals, oh my gosh. Um, but being nationals, like I couldn't or I wouldn't rather eliminate <laughs> that one. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm doing it all. This I seems guess, very like, s- not like you. This seems very like, <laughs> <laughs> like were you okay? Like, did- yeah. I mean, I guess the spoiler alert of that is all that like I raced marathon nationals. Then four days later, I may- raced the marathon world cup. Then three days later, I raced the snowshoe world cup XCO and I was planning to go then to Mount St. Anne and race the World Cup there. But that was where maturity had to kick in over desire. And I had to say, OK, you added a six hour race. The least you can do is eliminate a 90 minute race. Mm-hmm. Still don't know if all the people in my life would say that that's a fair switch <laughs> for my poor body. <laughs> um, but I did. I did responsibly so need to eliminate something. And I think that's a valuable lesson for everyone listening is I've, I've learned this year that I'm definitely known for being the person who races, 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 but even someone with that personality has to pause and be like, okay, there is a limit to, (laughs) to all of this. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. So let's talk about what unique preparation choices did you make due to the conditions? So let's talk about the conditions at the course this year. Yeah, it was one of the gnarliest races I have ever done. And that's saying a lot. Like if you've seen some of the stuff I've done, like a lot of people have probably seen Mid-South photos and things like this. 
uh, things like that. This race was, it, it was, I, I, it's like, I can't even come up with the right word because it was just so wild. The day before I, because I was still trying to recover, uh, from a previous race and all the travel and everything else, I only got out to see five miles of the course. So I didn't really know what the entire course was going to be like, but I knew that it was going to be wet. And so I just made the best decisions that I could based on that. Snowshoe in general has a lot, a lot, a lot of roots and rocks. Like it is a root maze. We're not just talking about like, oh yeah, there's a lot of roots on the trails. It's like a root going every possible Mm -hmm. direction. And it was very wet. And so I think the smartest move I made around equipment was probably around tire choice because that was a really hard decision without knowing the whole course. And ultimately, I decided even though it was really wet and muddy, I didn't want to use a mud tire because a mud tire wouldn't necessarily help you on the slick routes. Mm -hmm. And so I opted for actually Kenda's one of their fastest rolling tires, um, which is the Kenda Rush 2.4. And I opted for it because it's it has really strong side knobs, really tall side knobs that would still give me good traction in the mud. But all of the lugs are spaced pretty well apart. And so I was confident that it wasn't going to pack up, which was probably my biggest fear, not knowing the course and knowing how all the mud out there might um, change and unfold throughout the race. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted a tire that wasn't going to pack up. I wanted a tire with strong side knobs. The 2.4 allowed me to run lower pressure. And then I also had an insert in the rear. So I ran for me what was lower pressure, which I think a lot of people, including Jonathan, um, would not consider very low (laughs) pressure, but I'm very fearful. But I ran 16, 17 PSI, which I felt like for me was uh, definitely a move that I made for the conditions. Yeah. Wow. This is significant, though, Hannah, because I feel like you're the race pace strategy queen. And I feel (laughs) like you need or you just you really lean into knowing a course or, you know, having a plan and Mm -hmm. going on the feel of what the course is like to make a plan. And I know so many athletes struggle with this, not being able to see a course and know how they want to pace it and know how they will ride it. And therefore it's hard to make expectations, right? To be like, I have this goal. I want to do this. And I know exactly how to do it. I know how to execute it because I know what I will do in each part of this course and how I want to ride it. So how do you, when you have no idea what's going to unfold, how do you stay in the mindset of like, I'm going to still try to win and I know that I can, and I believe I can, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. And it, it makes me also pause and reflect on the strategies that I normally have, because like you said, like I really analyze courses. I make really extreme plans. I mean, we see that with Leadville, like this is my plan and I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm. But then I go to this race where I don't have a plan where I don't know the course and boom, it all comes together for me. And so I don't know that that necessarily means one is right and one is wrong, but it does cause me to pause and reflect And if nothing else, like you said at the start, like a lot of people go to races without the proper preparation or quote unquote, the optimal preparation. And I'm here to tell you as someone who has had both of those, Mm -hmm. I don't actually know if there's ever perfect prep. Like the perfect prep is the prep that you lean into. Um, And this is what I had. And I never questioned it because I wasn't going to skip marathon nationals. Like I, what there was no, to me, there was no other option. So when I was there, it was like, yeah, I'm doing the best I can with what I have. And I think that confidence helped. I think that another thing I was dealing with is at this world cup, there was a, you know, there were several of the Europeans I'd never raced before. So I also had no idea how I stacked up to these other women Mm -hmm which in some ways was intimidating, but in other ways, I feel like it just gave me like this new lease on life because Mm -hmm. instead of feeling like, I know that usually I beat this person or usually this person beats me, it was just, instead it was like, I'm standing on the start line and I've decided that I'm going to win today. And Mm -hmm. that was a really, like, it it was a really nice and ultimately rewarding thing. Um, It could backfire, but 
it definitely gave me the confidence to start the race the way I wanted. I, being that it was a very, very technical race mm -hmm. um, and a lot of single track and very, very wet. And it was wet in a way that I'm sorry. I just think this is so interesting. It wasn't raining. It was the humidity. I looked at my phone the morning of the race. It was 97%. Oh, no. And so <laughs> we were literally in a cloud where it wasn't raining, but standing in the start line, I had water dripping off of my helmet, That's like a so continuous wild. just stream. So it was just wet in a way that I've never really experienced. Wow. And I knew it was going to be a lot, a lot of mistakes out there. It wasn't going to be who didn't make a mistake. It was going to be who overcame the most mistakes. I mean, there was a point where I literally slid off a rock into a river. Oh no. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> crazy, crazy things were happening out there. But I wanted the whole shot because I wanted to control the race from the beginning. And then the next really big move that I don't think anyone else would know was big, but was huge for me was I then relinquished the whole shot. I got it. I took the confidence. I set the pace. And then after that first single track, I stepped back and took second wheel, which I think for a lot of people, like, yeah, that's the strategy. But for me, that's a really scary thing to do. For me, that's like the, for me, that was the ultimate showing of confidence because I believed in myself enough to follow a wheel yeah. than feeling like I just needed to be in control and set the pace. I believed that I could follow the pace. Yeah. And once I did that, what I really settled into was knowing that <laughs> it was exhausting. And I uh -huh. could tell everyone around me felt that way too. Like it was mentally exhausting, just like your core, your hands, everything trying to stay upright on these roots. And it occurred to me that this race was going to be a race of attrition. Mm -hmm. Like even if I got away in the first hour of the race, it still was going to come down to who could overcome hour after hour after hour. And so while usually this voice in my head is saying, you know, what's the next move? Where are you going to attack? Where is this? Where is that? I feel like in this race, I was really able to just calm down and say like, this is going to turn out the way it turns out and letting it and watching it. It really felt like instead of being in it, in some ways I was just watching the race unfold until the final hour where it's like, okay, well now it's just me, one other person. And all I've had to do is keep going basically mm -hmm. rather than burning so much energy the whole entire race figuring what to do I let that strategy wait until the last hour yeah that's a very different kind of attrition in a race to go from something where you know a course will, will wear you down or the attrition aspect is like who is the strongest in this section and how can we wear each other down to how can this course wear us down and who will make the least number of mistakes later? And then, yeah. and then how do you like eat during a race like that? <laughs> like, yeah, that was honestly a huge thing that I realized almost immediately, like within the first 30 minutes of the race, I was like, man, this is exhausting. And luckily that also triggered in my head, wow, you're going to burn a lot more calories mm. because it's the whole body, body language. I mean, you see it when you watch these racers race in muddy conditions. That's what we're doing for six hours. It's our whole body. Mm -hmm. It's not just our legs. And so we are ripping through calories in a, in a much higher rate than we normally would. So wow. I immediately made the decision to increase my carbs per hour uh, plan. And I think that that massively paid off. And also it was really hard to eat, but that was another one of those things where knowing that it was going to be attrition, I was okay. If someone got a five second gap while I stuffed something in my mouth, mm -hmm. because I knew those five seconds would more than be paid off by having that fuel I needed. Mm -hmm. Especially on such a long course like that, like not eating enough can cost you more than a few minutes if you really oh, mess it up. Oh, so much. Yeah, because yeah. you start making so many mistakes. And I, what I notice on a course like that is you start making more mistakes before you even realize you're tired. You know, like in a race like Leadville, I feel like 
the wheels start to fall off and you very quickly realize, (laughs) oh my gosh, I can't make it up this hill. I'm exhausted. But I feel like very different in a race like this, you start dabbing, you start crashing, you start walking and you're like, why am I just riding like a goofball all of a sudden? (laughs) And then you realize like 30 minutes later, oh my gosh, it's because I haven't eaten anything and now I'm shaking. Um, so yeah, I think just that awareness is really important. Wow. That's wild. And then, uh, what is recovery and resting like on a course like that? It's just, I mean, I just feel like in a marathon XC or a longer race, you need to choose the sections of the course to rest, right? You can't just be like on and hammering all the time. So how do you do that in such a technically demanding terrain, you know? Yeah, I think, um, that's an interesting question. Cause I think that Some of it comes, that's one reason why I'm thankful to be in a group for some of this, because Mm -hmm. I think when you're alone, you almost can't afford to give yourself those moments or rather they're not obvious. I'm sure you've experienced this too. Like when you're at the front of the race, it speeds up and slows down, speeds up and slows down. But if you're chasing, you're chasing the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so being at the front and being in a group, there are natural moments where it would lull, where maybe the front of, person in front of you would eat and you're like, oh my gosh, I get to rest for a second. But also I think w- taking advantage of the moments you feel good and being okay with the moments you don't because it was a roller coaster out there. Mm-hmm. Like there are several times and I think everyone experiences this and I think more people should talk about it. Like, there are so many times in that race when I feel like garbage and I think if anybody attacked right now, I would be done. You know, like <laughs> you just have these moments where you're like, I cannot do this. Like this is too hard, but then they go away. And then 20 minutes later, you have a moment where you're like, why are we going so slow? I'm going to attack. Why are we going so slow? Like I'm the best here. I'm the strongest in the group. And it yeah. like ebbs and flows so quickly. And it's, not giving in to either of those emotions. So like when you happen to feel good for 20 minutes, like just embrace it Mm -hmm. and like be excited that you feel like the pace is slow. When you feel like you're going to die, don't give up because you're going to like, you're going to get through it. You're going to have that next one. And I think that is probably one of the biggest emotions that we can all relate to from Mm -hmm. first to last out there. Cause everyone, I promise you, (laughs) everyone has those moments. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. That's such good advice. Thanks, Hannah. Yeah. And I think this whole race for you speaks to how nice it is to really rest in the confidence that preparation in your abilities and your fitness really gives you that you can just like, and this is not just at your level either. Like when at any level, when you've done the work and can really lean into and rest upon what you've done, you can just like throw a race like maybe not like this in your (laughs) calendar you know but when there are so many unknowns like this and you didn't know your competition and you didn't know the course like it's so nice to just like take a breath and be like I've done the work I know how to do this I know what I want to do and whatever happens out there happens and to just Mm -hmm. like trust in that feels so good as an athlete and like look what can happen when you do that you know yeah and I don't want to advocate for like over racing or anything like that. But I think another thing people ask me a lot about like, what race should I do? Or what should my goals be and things like that? And I think the reality of the situation is it's whatever excites you. And that Mm -hmm. seems like a cop out, but I really feel like, you know, every race I do excites me for sure. That's not what I'm, I'm not trying to say they don't, but as you can tell, based on my lead into this, like I was really amped for this race. Like Mm -hmm. I chose to add this race to my calendar because I felt like something really exciting could happen there. And I think sometimes when you line up just with more excitement, maybe than anyone else, sometimes that is the secret sauce. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, congrats, Hannah. We're super stoked for you. Um, the pictures look epic. You look so. Everyone just looks so dead. If you don't, uh, if you don't follow Hannah on Instagram, everyone go find her. Hannah underscore Finchamp. Um, Hannah, you also have really good post race write ups that make you feel like you're there racing with you. I love reading those. So. Oh, thank yeah. you. And I love the pictures. You just look so dead, like mud zombie. It's insane. I love it. If- it's about how I felt. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay, cool. Let's get into Michelle's question. 
Michelle writes us, I just started racing in Europe in February of 2023. Belgian Kermesses, some UCI races, and Grand Fondos. Nice. Um, after starting to train seriously over just a year ago. I'm 28 years old, uh, and she, Michelle's a woman working full-time, and structured training is 12 to 15 hours since the start of the season. I have improved my watts considerably over the race season. However, I gained over 2 kilograms from 55.2 kilograms, or 121-ish pounds, before race season to now 57.5 kilograms, which is around 127 pounds. Uh, with my lifestyle, recovery is challenging, read impossible, and I don't have the greatest sleep in general. I'm definitely eating much more than I had before training, uh, but I don't really feel like it justifies the weight gain. Why am I gaining weight when, I'm, when I've been riding so much and not eating overboard? Um... A couple, I see a couple red flags in in this question, in this narrative, Hannah, but I'm curious to see what you think. Oh my gosh. I think, well, first of all, we don't have that much information, mm -hmm. but in some ways that kind of excited me. So I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many things we can touch on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's just go back and forth. I mean, the first thing I want to say is two kilograms isn't that much. No. Like I know that stepping on the scale and seeing that difference can potentially feel frustrating if you're really aiming for a certain weight, but I pro like it, it just isn't a bowel movement can account for one kilogram. So, <laughs> I mean, and that sounds like such a silly thing to say, but mm -hmm. for anyone who watches their weight that quick, that closely, you have to be realistic about it. And that's one of the things is like, if you haven't taken a bowel movement, that's one kilogram. And then you're only looking at one, then the other kilogram, like, okay, where's that coming from? Now we're not looking at such a big thing. Some people can see like one to two ish, two would probably be a lot kilogram gain across the course of a day, depending on what you're doing, hydrating, eating throughout that one day. And so that's my first thing I just want to put out there is it's really, not that much. So don't stress. And then also I'd be curious to know how you're getting these numbers. Like I said, like the course of the day, the timing, weighing yourself, all of that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So if you are weighing yourself every day, if you're weighing yourself more than once a day, mm -hmm. um, really recommend cutting that back and maybe just weighing yourself like one time a week. Usually after a rest day can be a good time because your body has sort of hit this like for lack of a better word, equilibrium. So the morning after a rest day and start going on that one time a week rather than weighing yourself all the time where you'll see all these fluctuations. And for some people that can really spin you out and that's never a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the, by red flag, I mean, you know, the concern over this weight gain when I just like, mm -hmm. don't see it to be an amount of weight that you should be concerned about when you just started training a year ago and you're start you know you're racing and getting faster and eating more because you're doing the work like this seems like totally normal to me and you know if you have a problem with like your body composition like it doesn't seem like Michelle's concern was like hey I'm writing because I'm writing in because my body composition has changed a lot and I'm really concerned about it you know we're looking at just a raw number raw number and I know for me like I upped my training and volume and the amount of food I, um, eat like in general and more specifically like protein and making sure I'm getting enough carbs for workouts. And my body composition has changed a little, but I gained Hannah since last cross season, almost 20 pounds, like 20 mm. pounds, which is crazy mm -hmm. to like, look at myself and know that my body composition hasn't changed that much. And just to know that I'm stronger. Like I'm just doing. That's what I was going to say. Like the main question with that though, is do you feel stronger? I feel stronger and I am measurably stronger than I have ever been. Like last year I yeah. cracked the top 20 in one UCI race, like on a fluke. And this first race block, I was in the top 20 for three of the four UCI races. Every single one, you know? See, so it's this like, is a massive success story. More people need to hear because I think people get so caught up in the weight number that they forget that that's not a number that anyone on the start line even needs to know. Mm -hmm. Like the number that is ultimately going to impact your race is 
probably watts per kilo, which we get so focused on that kilo that we forget about the watts. Mm -hmm. And both sides of those equation are what fluctuates. And for most people, or at least many people, the watts are actually there's such a bigger gain to be made there. I mean, mm -hmm. for many very active people, there's not much more that you can lose. No. And so you need to focus on what you can gain in the watts. Yeah. Is, is my body composition perfect? Do I look like super fit athlete athletes? No, but you're totally well, right. I think in some the, people would argue that. <laughs> I I think, think you look very fit. I think so. <laughs> you, if you're if you're listening uh, and not watching right now, I'm flexing and can you see my enormous arm muscles? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're so right that the watts are so much like what a what a more achievable and easy target that makes that work and training and racing so much more. Like you'll get the outcome you want versus by focusing on the watts and your power versus just the kilo, your weight, right? Mm -hmm. Something else that can happen sometimes too is, well, exactly what you, so one side is what you just said, right? Is like your body probably actually needs more calories. You give it to it, you do gain some weight, but you gain more power. Mm -hmm. Like that's an excellent scenario. Another scenario that happens is you, your body needs more calories. You give it more calories. It doesn't initially know what to do with those calories. So initially you do gain weight. Then your body says, oh my goodness, these are the calories you've been looking for. We understand what to do with these now. And your metabolism actually rises and that initial weight gain goes away. So mm -hmm. also depending on how long this has been happening, this could be almost like a transient sort of weight yeah. gain as well. Yeah, we we forget that our metabolisms are like have dumb caveman brains. And when you first start really eating, the caveman brain part of your metabolism says, "Oh my gosh, I don't know when I'm going to get this much food again. Like, let me store it immediately because yes. when will we eat again?" <laughs> and it does take a while to get your body out of that kind of like fight or flight for food mode, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um you And on that same like stretch is hormones mm -hmm. also can greatly impact how your body views the nutrients in the food and what it needs to store and what mm -hmm. it can use. And sleep can really impact those hormones. And so that's another big thing is if you, you said it's recovery is almost impossible and you don't have the greatest sleep in the world. So you even admit it. And the fact that you write that in the question tells me you probably already know this, which is so painful because like you said, it's almost impossible. <laughs> you might not be able to change it, but mm. that could be something. It could be that you're not able to recover or your hormones are out of balance because you're not sleeping enough or you're working too hard. And that could just be life or it could be, hey, maybe, you know, you said you're doing structured training 12 to 15 hours a week. That's actually a lot. It's a lot. Um, and so maybe you need to back that down and sleep a little bit more and everything within your body will settle. Yeah. I see someone like Michelle, uh, you know, describing their work, training, you know, recovery, sleep, everything. I see someone like this, just cortisol, like the stress yes. hormone, just like coursing yes. through their veins at all time. And not only mm -hmm. when you get in that cycle, do you continue to not sleep well, but yeah, recovery is bad. Your body composition and weight might be bad, but, um, yeah, hormones can really, uh, that stress hormone and feeling like you're doing too much, you know, instead of focusing on, you know, why did I gain weight? My, maybe the focus instead should be, how can I, how can I chill out and maximize yes. recovery so that, so that I can be strong, you know? The other thing I see with someone, I'm just picturing Michelle being a super busy person mm -hmm. who is probably very high achieving probably constantly doing something, constantly working and imagining Michelle potentially skipping meals. Mm. Obviously we don't have this information, but just based on what I'm seeing in this, what I see other people do is sometimes we don't have time to eat in the proper intervals. And so we'll consume all of our calories in chunks. So all in the morning and all at night, nothing in between because we're meal. way too busy. Yeah. And Snake who has meal. time for lunch? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so even though you're eating all of your 
caloric intake, your body is actually having moments of deprivation Mm -hmm. um, where you are going into negative, uh, you're going into calorie debt. You know, maybe you eat a lot in the morning, you eat 500 calories in the morning, you burn a thousand calories throughout the day. Now you're negative 500 calories. Mm -hmm. So when you go to eat at night, you've, you're already in a debt. Maybe you make up that debt, but your body already experienced that panic of we're underfueled, we're hungry, what are we doing? And that can throw off all kinds of things as well. Mm -hmm. Like the things like sleep and feeling Mm -hmm. like you can never stay on top of recovery and probably, you know, ultimately reducing the gains that you can make from training when the timing of your fueling and just regular eating is so off and so sporadic, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like another thing that I'll experience too is if I, if I'm not training a lot, my body won't crave carbohydrate the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just naturally the proportions of like fat, protein, carb sort of shifts when I'm not training a lot. But then when I do train a lot, my body craves those carbs. And Mm -hmm. so just naturally as it should, the percentage of my diet of carbs starts to increase. And I wonder if that has occurred for Michelle as well, which is a good thing. We Mm -hmm. like train a road. We talk all the time. Carbs are amazing. We want them all. Carbs also store water, which Mm -hmm. means that if all of a sudden a greater percentage of your diet is carbohydrate, you're probably retaining more water. And some of that weight could be water weight as well, which again, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Totally fine and healthy as well. Yeah. I think we can agree, Hannah, like Michelle, you've been training for one year. You're getting into racing. Maybe this is a good time. I don't know if like putting away the scale is the right call. Mm-hmm. I know it has mm-hmm. like helped me considerably, but this is not, you know, this is not a huge, I don't see this as a problem. I don't see this as something unique to you that is negative even or wrong, you know, something you should be concerned about. I see this as a really good thing actually. And mm-hmm. I hope that your mindset changes to, you know, another year from now, instead of saying I gained over two kilograms again, like why? Oh my gosh. I would love for your mindset to change to, I gained another two kilograms. Yes. I'm stronger. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Mm -hmm. I'm doing the training. I feel like I'm getting faster on the bike. Like this is a good thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So what are the odds? Do you think that some of that weight gain is muscle mass? Oh, I think it's, I think it's almost exclusively muscle gain. Like there's yeah. almost no question in my mind considering that mm-hmm. you just started training a year ago and you only started racing this February and started doing hard races already. You're doing like Belgian Comesses are bonkers and some UCI races and Grand Fondos. Like I bet Michelle's doing some really hard work and getting really, really strong. So I could almost guarantee that that's muscle and that's something to, you know, celebrate. Yeah. So yeah. congratulations, Michelle. Yeah. We're happy for you. Yeah, you're doing good. <laughs> Two kilograms? Yes. Like, do more. <laughs> Gain more. <laughs> cool. Okay. I love it. Let's get into Mark's question. Mark says, hi, TR team. Like most TR members, I am probably prone to overthinking all cycling-relating stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, except for me. Uh <laughs> All right. Mark says, my latest idea is to turn off the fans for approximately the last two weeks of my specialty training phase. Mark's talking about in train road with plan builder, you can make a plan, a training plan for your goal race or event. And the final phase of training is called the specialty phase. And it's like the last part of your workouts are really meant to like sharpen the knife and really kind of like top off all this like big building that you've done in your training. It's really great. And it's event specific it's discipline specific it's really cool anyway so mark is thinking i should turn off my fans for indoor riding for approximately the last two weeks of my specialty phase this is assuming my event will be in warm weather i know you've covered warm weather and adaptation before in the podcast as i remember you don't need loads of it and it's best to do it close to your event my thinking is as the intensity duration of the sessions drop during the final two weeks of specialty as you taper into the event, this gives me an opportunity to turn off the fans and do these as warm weather adaptation sessions. Does this make sense to do? When I turn the fans off, I definitely start sweating a lot more, even on easy sessions like Pettit. My only worry is that these rides will therefore be a bit more fatiguing than expected, which could hamper the taper. 
I'm not sure they are significantly harder though, so I think this might be a good route to go, at least for some of the sessions. Would you keep doing keep the strategy for endurance type of rides only, or do you need to include some harder efforts to get the benefit of heat adapt- adaptation? Many thanks for all the great info you share with us on the podcast, Mark. Um, and I haven't tried to do heat adaptation outside of the, like a sauna setting, um, not mm-hmm. riding in a sauna or anything, just like doing sauna or like heated sessions after training apart from training. Have you had any experience trying to like simulate heat adaptation during training or with fans or something? Um, I haven't done a ton, uh, in the indoor setting, but I actually am planning to do this, this coming winter. And so I've thought a little bit about it and Ivy, have you ever ridden indoors without a fan? Yeah, definitely. We, (laughs) yeah, we, I just like, didn't, um, think that it was the fan was going to make that much of a impact on me. And so even now the fan that I use, Nate, kind of roasted me for this on the last podcast too but (laughs) I just use like I have a little tiny like 10 inch indoor fan that I use for basically white noise at night and I'm like oh yeah it's like it's basically a fan it's like a trainer fan it's good enough no it's not and then I felt like a real fan an indoor training fan I was like oh yikes this is what is supposed to happen to you and it really does make a difference for your RPE when you're not just like baking and dripping (laughs) a huge difference like riding without a fan I would just call it miserable like I really can't sugarcoat it any other way it is so terrible and so I think that Mark I think you're setting yourself up for a little bit more misery than you need here I think you do mention part of the equation which is the fact that you'll be more fatigued from these sessions but you're also not going to get as much quality out of these sessions. And I think specialty phase is different than taper in trainer road. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the specialty phase, I mean, you still want to be getting good quality workouts. And I think that you're setting yourself up to potentially actually fail some workouts when you're getting close to your race, which will not set you up for your confidence either. And I think, so basically what I'm saying is I don't think you should do that. I think you should do all of your workouts, your workouts with the fan and then your heat adaptation, you can either cool down without the fan or add maybe 30 minutes of easy riding after your workout without the fan, because then you're still getting in the quality workout. And then that, that 30 minute time period without the fan is purely focused on heat adaptation rather than stressing about the fact that you're not hitting your numbers while trying to heat adapt as well. Like it's just, you have too many stimulus going on in Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Especially, and you're right. Yeah. Especially in that specialty phase, you know, depending upon how much time you build out in plan builder before your event, your specialty phase, you know, it's at, it's at least a few weeks. And so in the early part of your specialty phase, there's some really key like VO2 max workouts, mm, like really, mm-hmm. really crucial high intensity workouts. And to, like you mentioned, potentially fail those that are important and confidence boosting and will really prepare you for your event. Like that's not the best time to do this. And mm-hmm. yeah. So doing heat, heat ad- adaptation or trying to like get some end result from a workout like this, other than just doing the work and doing the workout might not best prepare you for your goal, you know? Mm -hmm. But you have, you do have part of it, right? I think two weeks is about the amount of time that you need for heat adaptation and you do need it close to the event because it does go away quickly. And so you're thinking along the right lines, but then you need to think exactly like, what Ivy said she's done is a lot of people do heat adaptation through saunas. And so in many ways, that's almost more of what we're trying to replicate in this than exercising in the heat. We want you to do your full workout and then turn off the fan because then you're still getting the quality workout, but you're basically just making up for maybe not having access to a sauna. Mm Mm-hmm. And like a lot of gyms have, um, like a week pass. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, 
to just go get a couple week pass and to go sit in the sauna for a bit after your workouts, I feel like that would be so much more impactful than potentially not getting the most or doing the, getting the right intention out of your time on the bike, um, you know, and potentially like hindering your recovery and making yourself not enjoy the time on your bike, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. making those indoor workouts so hot and miserable. And, and even still like Hannah, I know that this could help you a little bit in heat adaptation, but I feel like it's still, unless the room that you're in is like absolutely baking, like just to be sweating more is not just to get a little more sweaty. Isn't the same in comparison to a real heat adaptation of getting in a sauna after your workout, you know, they're, they're not really comparable in terms of how effective they are. Yeah. I think if, I think if you really want to go all in on this or, you can do um, sort of like two a days, or maybe if there are some days you're not riding at all, so sort of like a rest day, um, but it won't really be a rest day if you're doing this because it's still strained on your body, so you mm-hmm. have to be careful. But again, just 30 minutes at a very low intensity. We're talking like IF of like 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5. Um, you could ride with the shower on hot in the bathroom, or you could ride with the dryer on in the laundry room. Or the other reason I recommend at the end of a ride is because your body heat will already be so high from the workout, even with the fan. When we exercise, about 75% of our energy goes into expelling heat. And so just by exercising alone, you're producing tons of heat. So if your body heat is already elevated, Mm -hmm. you turn off the fan and you kind of keep that engine running you probably will hit some pretty high body temp numbers. But like Ivy's saying, you really have to do all these steps correctly because otherwise what I see a lot of people unfortunately do trying to do heat adaptation is make themselves miserable with very little gain because they get like 80% of the way Mm -hmm. and don't hit that last 20% to be a hundred percent there. And then it's just more fatigue, more stress on the body, not good workouts. And oops, I got to the race and it still feels hot. (laughs) Yep. Seriously. Yeah. So Mark, you have the right, you have, you know, you are 80% of the way there and knowing that you should, if your A event is going to be in the heat, you should do some heat adaptation at least a couple weeks before. But yeah, Hannah has some good ideas on how to do that that are probably more effective than just making your workouts miserable. So don't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> cool. Let's get into Donovan's question. Donovan says, hi, train road crew. Love the podcast. Five stars every single time. Thank you. Donovan's talking about rating us on Spotify, iTunes, anywhere you listen to your podcast. Please do it. It helps us a lot. It helps us keep recording podcasts and have guests like Hannah here with us. Uh, so Donovan says, I have been listening for about six months. Haven't missed a single episode. That's awesome. Thank you. Two questions I'd like to ask. One, I am a junior mountain biker from Florida and I recently competed in the mountain bike marathon national championships. I placed eighth out of the 19 riders in the junior men category. Congrats. That rules. I'm very happy with this result, but I couldn't help Mm -hmm. noticing that all the riders around me had many, many more years of experience than me. I've been mountain biking for three years and racing for two. My recent FTP put me at about 257 watts, so 4.3 watts per kilogram. That's awesome. And I'm happy with how my fitness is improving. I do feel, though, that my experience is giving my competitors, or I think Donovan means their lack of experience is giving my competitors a big advantage. And I wanted to see if you guys had any experience on how I could either change my training or race strategy to make up for this loss or if you had any other tips. My current employee is the start steady, stay within your mean strategy to hopefully not waste energy trying to keep up in the starts as I am a lighter rider, 5'11", about 130 pounds, who prefers climbing and not the fast starts. I train 10-ish hours a week with two days off. So Hannah, what would you tell Donovan? When did you start racing mountain bikes and did you feel like you were in this place as a junior? Like racing as a junior sounds so tricky, honestly, to feel like you're always catching up. I feel like my journey in sport is so abnormal from the standard (laughs) that it's hard to compare. Like I started racing triathlon at nine. So in many ways I was this person with loads and loads of experience. And then I did race Nike in high school and then I raced collegiate, 
but I viewed myself as a triathlete that whole time. So I didn't start exclusively like feeling like I was a cyclist until I was 20, which is funny because in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't have the experience. Like I didn't race Mount, I raced high school, but I never raced junior. Like mm-hmm. I didn't race the USAC junior stuff. And so when I showed up to some of the USAC races in U23, it felt very much like, oh my gosh, I'm on the back foot. But on the contrary, there were probably a lot of people looking at me thinking, oh my gosh, Hannah has so much experience. She's been racing since she was nine. (laughs) And so I think I tell that to say that it's all in the eyes of the beholder. Like you probably feel one way. Other people probably feel another way. Also, hate to break it to you, but there's going to be someone, many people who come in and 1718, U23, pro, who you've never raced before, who are going to be big competitors. And it's, <sighs> Ivy, can we just take a moment to <laughs> acknowledge the fact that Donovan has plenty of experience. He is so on track. Yeah. Donovan is ahead of the curve. <laughs> yeah. Please don't fret over experience. <laughs> yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, Donovan just like, looking at your results and being like, well, I'm eighth out of 19th and I just feel like my experience is holding me back and like, what can I do and how can I be better and compete? And I just like, I feel like as a junior or at any age, really, when you start to make those sorts of comparisons, it's just like the quickest way to burn yourself out in the sport. Mm-hmm. It's the quickest way mm-hmm. to be disappointed, to feel like you're you're not enough, that you're not getting what you need to out of the sport and mm-hmm. to instead just... Like, these are the things that I am good at. This is what I like to do. Like, these are the races that I like. I'm going to work as hard as I can to prepare, and I'm going to, like, make a plan and race as hard as I can. And, and, you know, if there are things that I can work on, I'm going to do it. But to be like, you know, I just, I feel like I see this mindset all the time, and I am was guilty of it too, just being like, Mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, like, why? how do I, like, I'll never catch up, like, these people like can train so much more than me. They have more support than me. They have been riding so much longer than me. Like how do I bridge this gap to be at their level and focusing on how do I get to where they're at was just like, so it just like tears you down. It just makes you Mm -hmm. feel so much worse about like the things that are good about your experience in racing and riding. It makes you forget all that stuff. And instead just makes you like compare and kind of like cut yourself down, you know? Yeah. When I think another thing we see a lot in junior in junior racing is this need to always play out the story. Mm -hmm. How is this person going to be 10 years from now? Um, Is this the next, you know, Nino or why do they do that to these literal (laughs) unfair because and I see it on both ends of the spectrum. You know, there are these phenoms who are 15 years old, who everyone stands around saying they're the next big thing. We need to give them every opportunity, this, that, and the other. And you know what? Some of them aren't racing three years later. Mm -hmm. And then there are some people who haven't even started at that age and come into the sport years later and actually do become the next big thing. And That doesn't mean that we should never get excited when someone's fast. We should definitely celebrate these kids that are absolutely crushing it. But we can celebrate someone's immediate success without putting the pressure on them that they're going to be the next big thing. And in turn, sometimes that kind of diminishes the efforts of the other kids. I rem- like there's sometimes when there's one kid that's so dominant that everyone focuses so much on them that second place gets a little bit lost and mm-hmm. maybe they're the one who's actually going to continue the sport longer. And so we've digressed a little bit <laughs> from mm-hmm. this question, but <laughs> I just feel so passionate about these younger categories understanding that success is fantastic. I am so proud of you, but focus on the fun. Like it, again, it sounds just so cliche, but as a 15 year old, my number one goal for you is to still be racing in five years. That is number one. Mm -hmm. The number two goal is to be as fast as you potentially can be, you know, but I just want to keep you in the sport. And so 
just rest assured that you can make up that gap. Don't fret over experience and know that that experience kind of levels out. Like at this point in my career, when I line up, I really never look at the people next to me and think, well, I've been racing pro for seven years and you've been racing pro for 10 years. So I'm still three years in debt. Like at Mm -hmm. this point, we're just going to call it even. Yep. Okay. <laughs> like, it just kind of, so it, it's almost like age, like at a certain point, these age gaps really diminish. And so it's not to say that you have to wait five years or 10 years or whatever for these experience gaps to go down. It could go down next season, mm-hmm. but just know that like, this is not, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? This is not forever. This is not like what you, this is not the cards you've been dealt. Like this will go away. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's really sound advice, Hannah. Uh, Donovan Um, does. Oh, go ahead. Oh, but I do think we can still address his race strategy. Yes. Um, Because I'm guessing, I mean, as much as you like to start steady, stay steady. I'm Ooh. guessing this is not what you get to do in most of your races. It's not what I do in my races. So yeah. I want to hear what you have to say about that. I noticed that too. Yeah. Uh, when Donovan asked, you know, how can, what advice do we have when seeing that, you know, that Donovan doesn't love, you know, hopefully not wasting energy to try to keep up in the stars. Oh boy. Sometimes you just got to do that. (laughs) Like, especially, especially in XC. I mean, I feel like Hannah, like, don't you feel like some of these XC starts, like cross starts, a lot of off-road stuff, you are, you go so uncomfortably hard beyond sometimes what I even do comfortably in training, but it's just what everyone else is doing. And you just, you just have to do it. And you just have to trust that it's hard for everyone else too. And we're just like Mm -hmm. doing this for a moment and it'll pass. And then we get to settle Mm -hmm. in and then we get to ride steady and stay within our means, you know? Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I think, (sighs) I think that sometimes I will feel like these starts are so ridiculous and you do start to have in your mind, like everyone is going too hard. (laughs) I have the strategy, (laughs) but I think the reality of the situation more often than not is Everybody knows we're going too hard and everybody's doing it anyway. So Mm -hmm. as much as it might actually be smarter to go steady, it's just not the option. And the reason for that, you know, if if it was a wide open hill climb, for example, pace it out like strong and steady wins Mm -hmm. the race. Mm -hmm. But especially in a course like the Marathon Nationals course, I mean, I was there and the start wasn't that long. It was just a few minutes. And then we entered single track and gosh, I think there was like two or three openings, the remainder of the race, the rest of it was single track. And so honestly, if you expended energy in the start, got in good position, you could recover for a while because no one's going to pass you. No one can pass you. And that's probably what a lot of those other kids were doing and knew that they were doing. And I would guess that that impacted your race because you probably struggled to pass people and ultimately probably had to burn more matches passing people than you would have had to burn just in that start. And that goes as well for courses where maybe you need to go really hard at the start because you need a wheel to draft on because there's a really long flat section mm-hmm. that people are going to be in a pace line on or something like that. So I don't want to say that that's where experience plays in because I, I hear what you're saying is more experience would help you see that. And that's where I think you're right. But I think you know these things, mm-hmm. or at least you're learning them right now, which is awesome. And so what comes with that experience isn't the sudden ability to be stronger, but what comes with the experience is to be able to look at a course and say, I need to be ahead at this point because after this point, there's no passing. And so I'm going to do whatever it takes, you know, effort wise to get to that point first and learning how and when to burn those matches appropriately is something that'll probably take time. I mean, that is racecraft. So I'll be honest, like, I feel like I'm still learning that definitely Mm -hmm. as well. And that's what like many of us in races are 
all equally as strong. And it's those decisions that determine the outcome of a race. So these are lessons that you're going to be playing with and learning for your entire career. <laughs> yep, totally. And it might, for some of these riders that are beating you too, it, Donovan, it might not even be an experienced thing that the folks beating you are more experienced. They just might be, you know, delusional enough to follow <laughs> the really hard start and then find themselves in a better position, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so from a training perspective too, you know, I get it. We hate these starts. Like it's so bananas. Like it feels horrible. We hate it. But there are very specific aspects of training that will prepare you to do these really intense, unbelievable short efforts and then settle into the effort that you need to settle into. And if you don't train this system, like I feel like I didn't do a good job of this in years past. And so because I didn't train that system, I would do a hard start and then never recover and never, you know, to be able to settle into that pace is so such a specific type of fitness that needs is a, that needs to be developed. And if you don't, you you have to dip back down and recover before you go back up and settle into your race pace. And so that's something to consider with your training approach. You know, are you doing the work that is preparing you for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's get totally into agree. Donovan's second question. Uh, number two, during the race, I had a mixture of goose, scratch, high carb, and scratch hydration to try and get 100 grams of carbs per hour. I ended up doing this for the first two and a half hours until another rider cut off my bottle handoff, not on purpose. Oh, that's horrible. That's such a bummer when you see your support person reaching out and someone else just accidentally like, whoops, oh, it's heartbreaking. I feel like everything goes into slow motion where yeah. you're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Donovan says, I had to ride 35 minutes without water. After I got my next bottle, though, I felt like I wanted nothing more but plain water, so I didn't drink much of the mix bottle at all. Is there any way to balance between getting the right amount of carbs and getting the plain water I crave late in a race? Thank you so much, Donovan. Hannah, what do you think on this one? Do you ever crave plain water? Yes, all the time. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. feel like I just get yeah. sugared out, and it feels like you know, it feels like I'm drinking corn syrup or like <laughs> pancake syrup. And I just like, I want cold and fresh water so bad. But, uh, and I feel like, uh, that's a nice thing to do through a feed zone to just like, if you have the luxury of getting your drink bottle and then getting a water to just like get a blast of the plain water and then huck it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think if you're craving plain water, let's make plain water something you get in the race. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really, as long as you're getting the electrolytes and the carbs that you need, there's nothing wrong with taking in some plain water. I think because the focus is on electrolytes and carbs, we just kind of forget about the fact that water is also delicious, mm -hmm. but we can listen to those things can work in tandem. And so I just think that, well, for me, I always try and have both options, partially because I, I really like the high carb mixes. It's a really easy and great way to get in a lot of those carbs and put your hydration and your fueling together. But I think that you need to have a backup plan because sometimes you don't, hydration to me is the hardest thing to really nail because until you're out there in the conditions, you can guess how much you need but it's hard to really know, you know, with this humidity, this exposure, this little wind, this heat, like this is how much fluids I'm going to need. And so there are times where I will grossly miscalculate my hydration needs on the day. Like maybe it heats up throughout the race and all of a sudden I need a full bottle and I need it now. And I just like, I will down that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And if I'm downing, if I'm forced to down 60 to 100 grams of carbs in one bottle to get in that fluid, I'm going to have all kinds of gut distress because I just downed that in one <laughs> big gulp versus if I have a second bottle of water, I can then fulfill that need and continue to sip on the mm -hmm. fluids. Um, so maybe that was a confusing answer, but I would just say I think you should always have a little bit of both. If you have two bottle cages, that might be 
one bottle of water, one bottle mix. If you have a hydration pack, it might be mixed in the back, water in the bottle. Um, it might just be getting a different hand up each time. Like sometimes I'll get a hand up of the high carb mix and just that. And then sometimes I'll get a hand up of water with two gels taped to the water. And then that's the signal like, Perfect. hey, this one's yeah. water means you still need to eat these carbs instead yeah. of drinking them. But then I have that water as well. Yeah, that's a great strategy. I have another question for you, a hypothetical. I'm not going to dox this writer, but I know a writer. It's not me. Uh, that, <laughs> that at an XC race recently went through a feed zone uh, and missed the bottle and kept riding. And then my theory is that if they would have just stopped to grab that missed bottle, they would have lost less time than what they lost because it was so hot and uh, such a demanding, well, it was medium. But yeah, I just think they would have maybe lost less time if they would have just stopped and grabbed the bottle and then kept going. Mm -hmm. If in theory it was a slow feed zone, like on a climb, and you know you saw someone ahead of you knock out the bottle that you were going to grab, would you stop to get it? It totally depends on the race. Like I think <laughs> for Donovan, if they were in a group at Marathon Nationals, it was really hard to ride those trails at speed alone just because, I don't know, you kind of flowed together as a group. But the, the answer to your hypothetical, though, <laughs> is yes. Because I actually did – I got a bottle at Leadville. I was in a big group going across pipeline. I got the water at Leadville, saw like this, like it was one of those, I grabbed it, saw this huge pothole coming and was like, oh gosh, put it in my teeth so I could grab the oh. bars with both hands. And then I hit the pothole and it fell out of my mouth <gasps> onto the ground. So I had this moment where I thought, I have to stay in the group. I'm leaving the bottle. And then I thought, you literally have six or five hours of racing left. How stupid would you be to get behind on your nutrition and hydration? So yeah. I stopped, went back, picked up the bottle, turned around, went again. And like, yeah, I had to burn a match to catch up to the group. But I was so happy mm. that I had that bottle later. So, yes, there are dumb <laughs> scenarios where, like, slow down and get the bottle. <laughs> Great. Good. Yeah, just hypothetical. Just curious what you would do. Yeah. Uh, anyways, Donovan, sounds like you got, I hope you have a long career ahead of you. Try not to fixate too much on how to catch up to people with more experience than you. Just like find what feels fun and good about racing and lean into it. Don't you think, Hannah? Absolutely. And I think that the, you know, the curiosity that you're showing and the desire to learn is fantastic. I mean, how many 15, 16 year old racers are riding into a podcast to learn about their mm -hmm. specific race? Like kudos to you for being a student of the sport that is going to get you so far. And these kind of questions are what bridges the gap in experience. I mean, I see riders all the time who think they have experience and they don't listen to advice. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my opinion, advice is, gosh, listen to it all. You can execute on it or not. Even for me as a racer, like, no, I'm not going out seeking unsolicited advice. So, you know, but when someone does give me advice, you always have to take it to heart. And then, like I said, maybe you don't use it, maybe you do, but it never hurts to listen. So kudos to you for trying to learn. And I think that's going to really pay off big time. Yeah. And congrats on your race, Donovan. We're stoked for you. Eighth is really good. You should be happy on it. Uh, and thanks, Hannah, for joining us. We, yeah, all these athletes that write in, we're so grateful to have your insight. And congrats on your World Cup win. So sick. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. If you haven't, uh, listeners, subscribed to the podcast, please do so. And please give us some stars. It helps us keep going, helps us bring Hannah back. And we'll see you next week.